now opening the floor for questions to our great speakers. Um, may I have the assistance of our uh, project uh, program managers, please? Um, can we have somebody who would want to ask questions from the floor? Can you approach the front? Good morning, my name is Hilda Espina. I'm from the Datu UAP Lapu-Lapu chap chapter in Cebu. Uh, in your presentations on new urbanism, smart cities, and mobility-oriented development and design, I gather that a lot is dependent on mass and rapid transit systems. In preparing for your, uh, your development plans, how much effort, importance, and focus do you give on recommending institutional or organizational structures that operate and run these systems? The Philippines has a long way to go, I think, uh, towards adopting these new movements. Uh, ten years ago, uh, or a little more than ten years ago, we had our MRT and LRT systems. These are now aging and probably not much attention was given to, the, uh, to creating the organizational structures that should run these. Uh, my question is, is it not probably better to leave this uh, transit systems in private hands to operate and maintain and to keep it out of reach of political influence. Yeah. Okay, wow. That's a question. Maybe the three of them, I'm sure they, they would Is have some on? answers. Uh, obviously, around the world, there are many transit systems that are profitably operated by private organizations. Uh, but you have to have the political will to allow that to happen. In the United States, increasingly so, but it has taken a while for that uh, kind of public-private partnership to occur. Personally, I, th I'm, I totally agree with you. I think transit would be better served if by a private entity, because it is okay, profit-driven, uh, but it's going to make market sense. Whereas when it's government-funded, it gets mixed up in all kinds of entitlements and other kinds of uh, political issues that make it inherently inefficient then as a system. Uh, I want to uh, address your first comment about the most important is actually if you can make people walk, that's the most efficient before transit itself. Now on the organizations, I uh, quite agree with uh, what you both said that it should be like uh, PPP, public partner, uh, private partnership. So it can capitalize and uh, uh, the best example is always Hong Kong that uh, it can finance and make a lot of profit with MTR. Um, I've been coming to Manila for 22 years. And of course, similar, Tiok and I are working together on a project in Jakarta. I've been coming to Jakarta for maybe 15 years. And what I've watched happen, of course, is the traffic situation, whether it's your hometown of Kuala Lumpur or Metro Manila or uh, Jakarta, uh, the traffic situation is just out of control. Uh, I always bring a backup battery because inevitably I'm going to sit in traffic so long my cell phone is going to run out of battery. So it's a, it's a, a necessity. And, and you know, 
there has to be, as you say, will. People don't want to have to spend four hours commuting to work every day. It's just, it's a poor quality of urban life. Uh, when the urban population and the demands of urban life continue to grow in all of these cities, Kuala Lumpur, Jakarta, Metro Manila, Bangkok, the rate of urbanization is not stopping. People are still coming and they have a very poor quality of urban life because of the traffic problem. And so it, it, something's, it, it has to give. I mean, the economic, the economy of the city can't improve until we improve the transit system because w you know, basically our workforce is just wasting a huge part of every day just trying to get to work. Last night, uh, one of my colleagues was trying to get to Nino Aquino, and it was his, his, it was his first time to come to Manila. And uh, he called me, panicked, I'm going to miss my flight, Amy, I'm going to miss my flight. I'm still sitting in traffic trying to get to Terminal 1. Said, good luck with that. You're gonna be, you know, just to drive from Terminal 3 to Terminal 1 could take an hour and a half. Um, so, the you know, the, the people deserve better. <laughs> You know, the, the, there has to be a will to improve this. There has to be a will to collaborate. There has to be a will to build consensus and to make it possible to improve the connectivity of the city. So, thank you. I guess uh, is it, can is can it part of your plan, uh, the organizational and institutional structures? Yes. I'm sorry, I forgot that part. Uh, in our work in Malaysia, uh, developing the business case and the institutional model for SPAD to either evolve into the real estate development entity or to create a separate entity, quasi-government, that could easily partner with private development and I think we had an, a third one, but we always look at the business case. We try to figure out what would allow an agency to become the developer. One of the problems I think we were talking about before is that most agencies don't realize they're transit agencies, that they're in the property development business. And once we show them that bigger picture, they realize, oh my gosh, there's money to be made revenue streams to be created, and yet their charters often won't allow them to do that. So answer is yes, uh, we at Arcadis, RTKL, do the business structure alternatives for our clients to help them decide which way to go. Okay, thank you. Next, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, architect Dino Kerona from Eastern Province chapter. My, my uh, point is regarding on the transportation. Ma'am, I am living in the one municipality south from this place, and this municipality is has composed of 38 barangays. In our place, if you will look into the plan, our place is the core area, the, the central business district, wherein there is a small uh, farm to market road uh, built in. So I think as an architect, this is the right time to develop this area, as you said a while ago, that it is the best time to make, a, make an urban plan at this earliest of the stage. 40 years ago, our, tra our mode of transportation there is the PNR, the Philippine National Railways. I really love this train because this is very comfortable and very uh, safe mode of transportation. The only thing difficult of this transportation, if you are getting late, you will going to run fast and grab the, the, last grab the last bar of the train. So that is the hard part. Now, my point out is... Uh, that during that time, there is no highway or uh, main highway passing through our area. So all the small uh, 
uh, terminal uh, is all is built in around this area. When the uh, Kerino Highway, a diversion road, was built or constructed on that area, there is some small uh, jeepney uh, uh, terminal around it. And then uh, what I am trying to, I am amazing now because I, I think the past government, there is a program for rehabilitation for this train. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm really amazed now because this transportation now is gone. So what, my, uh, my, what, my, uh, what I would like to ask is that, is there any uh, better explanation regarding uh, urban planning why this train uh, was uh, totally vanished? Actually, these are all 100 years old, uh, around 100 years old train. And they're na, no longer working in some areas of the south. But it used to be the only prime transport coming from Manila to, to the south of Manila. I know in the United States, Chicago is my professional hometown. We have a radiating system of 100-year-old yes. uh, commuter rail. Um, I think it's fast enough. It's certainly convenient. Um, actually installed more than 100 years ago, around 1860 or so. I think the reason that it survived in the Chicago area is that development occur has occurred completely along those corridors and around each station. And the lobby for highways didn't affect the need to move workers into the central city. Now in your case, there are places where we're trying, in the United States anyway, where we're trying to restore the commuter rail system that we once had. But this time, instead of thinking of moving people from point A to maybe a central business district, develop uh, live, work, play, and learn environments at each of those stations so that you don't necessarily have to commute all the way into the city. We're starting to see that more in China uh, around some of the stations because the commute is getting too long, among other things. So restore it as a series of live, work, play, learn communities. But as I said before, each has its own character. So oh, build on that as a way of, as a stakeholder, encouraging your government and your transit agencies to put that service back into place. Well, that's a very nice idea, ma'am. So if there is any government agency <laughs> hearing from now, please bring back our train. Thank you very much, ma'am. It's PNR. Next, please. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm architect Joanna Dunka from the Tandang Sora chapter. And I have comments and queries for architect Adi and DCA. So first for architect Adi, uh, I would just like to appreciate that despite the ex existing transport scenario of Jakarta, you still have the passion and optimism to provide probable solutions to your city's problems, which I wish our we Filipino architects could also practice for our country. Uh, my question is for just comparison purposes. May I, I know the political structure of Indonesia and how the structure affects the process of development in Jakarta. Because in our country here, every six years, there is a change of um, government. So we have problems with uh, planning for long term. Architect Adi? Yes. Uh, we have a, a local government election every five years. Uh, Jakarta is a bit unique because it's con uh, special uh, a territory. It's called it a, a special capital territory. It consists of five municipalities. The mayor doesn't have a say in Jakarta. While in other cities, the mayor is very powerful now since the 1999 uh, local autonomy law. So the mayor actually uh, control their own budget. Um, recently, the 
our Jakarta governor, which was uh, 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 mayor from smaller city, become president. And it's uh, 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 a very fast career move for him. Uh, but in a, in, a, uh, in a different, in, in a negative way, it's uh, kind of a slow down the planning process actually in Jakarta. We have problem now. So um, what we have to do now is to educate the mayor. One of the mayor in Indonesia is actually working with Amy for quite a while in Bandung. Uh, he was an architect and becoming mayor. So I encar encourage either architects become run for mayor because they know what to do. Okay. <laughs> and or, or uh, as a organization, you can lobby the mayor because what important then is uh, connectivity actually. If the mayor doesn't talk to each other, how we could connect like uh, between Metro Manila and other, and then because uh, uh, people keep moving and people uh, uh, try to buy real estate everywhere and uh, you know, and then it will create a larger uh, economic scale for the city. Thank you and for DCA, uh, I would just like to appreciate again, sir, your candid presentation. We really enjoyed it. And thank you for sharing your professional experience and practice. Uh, we came to realize that it's just the same. We can also relate with you. And just the, a question. How were you uh, compensated for your 10 years worth of stamina? <laughs> Does every design change require a new contract? Yes. Are you go being paid for the uh, changes? Thank, th thank you for the questions. Uh, actually, I didn't elaborate. Uh, the client has been very kind. Uh, actually, on the same piece of land, we were paid three times. In, in other words, it's three projects because the land has been expanded. Uh, every time the pieces, uh, the new pieces of land he, he, he has bought, uh, after about a while, we were treated as a new project because I say that it wouldn't be fair to him as a landowner and it also not fair to us as architect so that the right size of land should have the right size of the building and the right type of the building. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, just for your info, uh, we were, how to say it? Uh, that particular fee for the house, uh, probably same as some of the construction costs of our earlier house. Thank I don't you know very I much, I sir. Can we have the next one, please? Hi, I'm Chai Fong from Alabang Chapter. I'd like to first thank each of you for what you've shared with us this morning. Um, I was just thinking also in a lot of uh, evenings with architect friends, uh, it's actually the um, Chan duo, I mean uh, DCA, that we, uh, when we would enjoy over wine and cheese, these are the conversations that we have, and it felt like work that is play. So I'd like to commend you for the work that you do because it doesn't seem like work, but you come up with the wonderful designs. Congratulations for that. Thank you. Um, but um, at one point, architects in the Philippines, especially um, here in Manila, no, maybe around the world, but then here in Manila, because of the problem of uh, mobility, um, we felt like uh, we cannot stay too much in that uh, part of architecture when we just enjoy, but really feel that we are working because we are directly affected also by this problem of traffic. and. As um, it was said earlier, that it, it's not fair to us who commute, who need to work and live in a city like this. But then I guess it's happening around the country. And so um, I wanted to really delve into this when we feel that uh, it's our responsibility. Um, I happen to work in a school that, is, uh, that finds itself right in the middle of um, a residential area at the outskirts of the university town. It was declared a university district by the Comprehensive Land Use of Manila. And um, 
it's it's growing. I mean that area, but then we my building finds itself without or the whole school actually finds itself without a campus. We step out of our buildings and we're right in the streets. And so uh, for our students to go around the three main buildings, they have to cross the street in streets which do not have sidewalks and with pedicabs, one way, you know, it's really a mess. For the past eight years that I've been teaching there, I, I felt like we were just uh, too, um, to, to, it's a messed up situation. But then we have embraced it, and now we're trying to turn it into a university town that is walkable, and uh, we're working with the two different schools in our area, and with the 24 barangays. This, these are the units um, of uh, uh, the smallest government unit in, in, in the city. Listening to you, um, there was something, and especially I would like to di direct this question to architect uh, Deanne. Um, you mentioned something about uh, transit-oriented development um, construction and structures, which is what we are working on. Uh, we have created a campus master planning plan, but then I'm very much interested in the MODE, and I would like you to, because it was not really, I mean, your discussion didn't say exactly, even if you declared it, that um, it is much more than TODs, that it's like an enhanced um, TOD solution. Could you like more or less point out what is, uh, that is something more uh, of the mode rather than just approach this uh, challenge as a TOD uh, a development thing? Try and be brief. Uh, as far as education is concerned, mobility oriented development or mode incorporates education as a social function into the design of the developments around as well as in stations. So, in your case, um, I don't know how close you are. Well, you may or may not have transit, but the difference between um, excuse me, I'm sorry. we are right beside uh, LRT. Uh, excellent. The, yeah, we're right beside. That's it. right. So all education, all corporations, all healthcare should be on transit lines. But that's for another day, right? <laughs> that's what you hope for. Um, the work we did in Malaysia, for example, in certain of the station areas where education was an issue, especially job training we incorporated education facilities into the stations themselves. And that's, I think, the difference between transit-oriented development is kind of connecting the dots, not that it's a bad thing, but mobility-oriented development is really looking at what the functions and the purpose of mobility is within an urban environment and incorporating that within the transportation functions. So, it can't occur everywhere, and it certainly has to occur with transit agency, regulatory, government, planning, et cetera. But I can think, actually, again, in Chicago, of another example where one of the stations that's being renovated by the Chicago Transit Authority has incorporated a secondary school immediately adjacent to it because students are coming from all over the city to that particular charter school. So don't give up on it. Um, make sure you insist on the connection, and that should help. Thank you very much. Very inspiring, thank you. Um, we still have uh, one more. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, concern, uh, concerning the urban planning growth, the, there is a one city here in the Philippines which is uh, very unique uh, I, uh, in Baguio City. So our very concern in that city is uh, the urban growth and the uh, massive uh, coming of uh, just like a, a tourist, uh, because uh, Baguio City is one of the tourist spots and uh, traffic is one of our 
main problem on that uh, city. And uh, I think transit is, uh, I don't know if it's just like in Hong Kong, they transit are connected to each other. That's why it's very accessible. But in that city, it's, uh, we have a, a very hard time to, the only transit is the jeepneys. If you happen to see the jeepneys. But during the summertime, every holidays and everything, uh, local tourists and uh, international tourists will go that on that uh, city, and we have a big problem on uh, traffic uh, uh, congestions and uh, everything. And uh, one of our, what is the possible solution to with this kind of situation? Uh, Baguio City is just a small city, but its uh, uniqueness is it was se uh, settled in a uh, the only city settled in a. Uh, mountain area. My question is, uh, what's the possible solution on this kind of problem? Well, in general, uh, and again, back to Chicago, we that's a major tourism, uh, trade and exposition destination in the middle of the United States. And a very big issue was getting the tourists from hotels to the exhibition areas to the museum campus and other locations. So in that case, uh, we created a special two-way, it's basically just buses, but it's se separated from the rest of the street grid. It actually falls in an old rail line corridor, uh, and it allows the mo a very, very efficient movement of tourists from hotels to the exhibition center and the museum campus. Now, I don't know if that's possible, but when you're dealing with tourists, they're not going to be totally comfortable with the jeepneys, right? Because they don't quite understand what's going on. So creating the type of transit system that will serve their particular needs is really what you need to do. One other thing we did in Chicago is developed, it's just a trolley. It's basically a bus, it, but it looks really cute. And it runs around the CBD and runs to the tourist sites uh, free on the weekends and at very low cost otherwise. That's the way to get the tourists out of the cars so they're not adding to the congestion. Just this. Can I ask a question? When you say your city is urbanizing, um, can you just give me an idea of the, your population, like what it was five years ago, what it is now, and what we think it might be? in terms of population density, ten, you know, another five years from now? Yes, uh, actually the city is uh, the only place here in the Philippines with, uh, which has a cold, uh, colder temperature. So uh, every local migrants okay. is already migrating on that city. So it's, uh, the growth is uh, getting uh, bigger. So from Lowland and the other places of the Philippines, some are migrating on that place already. So okay. the, 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 the population is getting uh, bigger and uh, uh, in s uh, in infrastructure such as uh, houses are getting uh, larger. Well, that would be my next question is, if you had to estimate what is the percentage of your population in your urbanizing city that lives in a house? A or a single house, house on that uh, of, uh, one family house dwelling is uh, I think uh, six to six uh, member of the family is the least. Yeah, I I, I ask this because we're talking about transit-oriented design, and the the previous gentleman who talked about wanting his 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 rail line back, and I think one of the points I was trying to make in presenting Fumi Hung Saigon South is there needs to be a rethinking of alternative forms of urban housing. One of the problems we see, for instance, Tioc and I deal with this in Jakarta, is there's two forms of urban housing, landed houses and skyscrapers. But the reality is, is there's lots of other alternative forms and scales and densities of urban housing that create very wonderful quality of life. So like my colleague here who talked about his apartment in, in Kuala Lumpur, right? I've, I've never, I have, I don't own a house. I've not lived in a house since I was a very little girl. I live in an apartment. 
I live in a medium-sized building in Hong Kong. It's only eight stories tall. I walk to work. It is a choice I made about my quality of life because I'm not willing to be a commuter. And, and so I'm able to do it because of the diversity of housing typologies. And what we see happening in Manila is this profound urban sprawl because of the love affair with the landed house. The, landed ha the love affair with the landed house and urban sprawl is what is causing all the traffic in what's making it so hard for that train stop to work because people live too far away from the train stop for it to work. They need, you know, they need car parks next to the train stop in order for the train stop to work. And so there's a certain amount of density and alternative forms of urban housing that are required in order to allow that urbanization and transit-oriented design to work. And it doesn't revolve around the landed house. It has to be around alternative forms of housing. And so people go to Europe and they look at Barcelona or Paris or you know London and they say, wow, it's such a great city. Nobody lives in a house, they live in buildings that are eight, 10, 12 stories tall. You know, there's a density of living that is essential to making it vibrant, compact, mixed use and walkable. So anything you can do in your city to avoid urban sprawl and develop alternative forms of urban housing, not just landed houses, is what's gonna help. I raise my children uh, in Riverside, Illinois. It's a Frederick Law Olmsted planned community from the 1860s. Everybody lives in a house there. However, we all could walk to the train station. We all could walk to the grocery, to schools, to soccer practice, to church, and that's the way it was designed. That's the original transit-oriented development. So I agree with you, over time, even in Riverside, uh, the development of mid-story, mid-level, mid mid-height residential has developed because older people want to stay in that community. They don't want to move away, but they don't want the big house anymore. So we are seeing the dread D word, density occurring even in an environment that was planned for single family homes. But the key thing is anybody in that community can get to the train station because it's all very, very walkable. Most of the homes in the Baguio City was developed in, in a single detached because we have an ordinance that, 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 that was struck by earthquake last 1990. So they bring out the ordinance that uh, not more than 10 story will be built on that uh, area. That's mid-rise. So. Uh, it's 1,400 above sea level, and it's, uh, say, 300,000 population. So it's quite, during, uh, that's the city, but during uh, summer and uh, holidays, it doubles. So that's the problem they have now. Yeah, uh, like in Bali. Bali has a limitation of no higher than palm trees, 15 stories. But the city actually, or, or the, the community, need to look into uh, one density, like Amy said, I fully agree. And secondly, replan the city. You have experts <laughs> besides me. Replan the city. Uh, 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 intervene, intervene with. Uh, we have Mayor the uh, Red One. Uh, uh, talk to private company to provide free buses that goes around that encourage tourists even take the buses. Also in Jakarta, they have like, although not, um, not many, but there's a bus, uh, tourist buses that goes around. I'm not saying that you should do that, do that but you should uh, look into it, plan it, and as an organization, you can politically say to the, your government about uh, uh, intervening with the transit. Thank you. Uh, and I, hello. I guess that uh, you have to cut because we have no time for another one. Sorry, can I ah, okay, have a last, last word? I, uh, my perspective will be very different from these uh, three of my colleagues here. Uh, uh, I will talk from a micro point of view. Actually, the houses that you saw uh, that we did uh, would not be possible uh, with the highway that built uh, uh, about 
15 years ago, uh, Kuala Lumpur has actually built a middle ring road. Basically, they create the outer layer of the highway. Uh, they felt that there's nothing much they can do inside the city. And that created uh, many townships. The houses that you saw, that some of we have, sh we have shown, is actually came from the highways. And uh, my firms are also at the edge of it. And we were just talking to a, a, a friend of ours just now, is that uh, 20, 20, 30 years ago, we used to go to Kuala Lumpur probably one, uh, three times a week. Today, we go to Kuala Lumpur once a month. The reason for that is I think with internet, uh, the idea of working at home, the idea of working within your neighborhood uh, become very sustainable. And the highways actually create a lot of townships. That's the reason, in fact, it free up the land. I think some of the earlier speakers were talking about. And now in KL, for example, um, the land in the outer part of the city, not necessarily cheaper than the one in the city. And what was interesting about it is that the, 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 land, the land price in the city, uh, I won't say is stagnant, but it has slowed down in terms of appreciation. The reason why is because there's a competition from outside KL. So, so this is also give a balance to the land prices. And more importantly, I think uh, allowing this uh, work, play and live at the same time. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Again, you, uh, we'd like to thank all our all speakers for this morning.